Sitting on the table was a bottle of Paraquat. His mind was spinning. His hands were shaking as he debated whether or not to drink the poison. His life had recently fallen apart. Because of covert 19, he had lost his job. There was no employment, no way to make money, provide for his family. And because of the increased restrictions, he spent more time at home, which didn't prove to do well for his marriage. He and his wife were fighting, arguing, yelling, getting upset over little things. And this created a stress and an environment that was unpleasant. Feeling tired, hopeless, and depressed, he looked to death as a way of escape. Fewer topics provoke more fear and distress than the topic of suicide. Just the word itself fills one with sadness and heartache. And talking about it somehow seems to make it even worse. There are many difficult questions that surround the topic of suicide. I think we all ask the question, well, why? Why would someone choose to end their own life? And then there are follow-up questions. Is it a selfish act? Is it self-murder? Is it the unpardonable sin? Now, I want to stop and just answer those questions very quickly. First is the question, why? Why would someone come to a place in their life where they choose suicide as the option? Well, I don't think we're ever going to understand or fully comprehend why somebody would take their own life. Now, I know at times there are those that will leave a note. They'll leave some type of message for those that are left behind. They'll explain why they felt it was necessary to take their own life. But even in those messages, we are left with more questions than really answers. I don't think we'll ever understand why or how someone can get to that point in their life where they feel that the only answer is to take their own life. Of course, we ask the question, is it a selfish act? Well, sometimes it is. Not all the times. But sometimes people do it as a way of retaliation, a way of revenge. They have in their mind that through taking their own life that they are going to punish or they're going to hurt those that they feel betrayed by, let down by. They want to inflict pain upon others. Sometimes suicide is a selfish act on the part of that individual. Then we ask the question, is it murder? Of course, the Bible says, thou shalt not kill. And we often put it in the context of this, of taking somebody else's life. But what about taking our own life? How does God view that? Is that murder? And is that a sin against God? Well, I believe that taking the life of an individual other than yourself, or even taking your own life, is committing the act of murder. And yes, the Bible condemns that. God says that we're not to take life. We are not the author of life, and therefore we are not the dictator of who will live and who will not live. Now, of course, there are cases where the Bible makes that exception, certainly in the area of self-defense, in defense of our family, in the defense of our nation. But when it comes to this of taking someone's life or ending our own life, the Bible opposes that behavior. And so this naturally flows into the next question. If a person takes their own life, is that the unpardonable sin? There are some religions and preachers that will teach that if you end your own life, that you cannot be forgiven, that you will immediately go to hell that there is no hope of eternal life, there is no hope of salvation, God will not forgive this sin. But yet when you study the Word of God and look on the topic of the unpardonable sin, you will find it very clearly taught 
that the only sin that God cannot forgive is the sin of unbelief. Jesus spoke about this in the Gospels. He said that there is a sin of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. When we blaspheme the Holy Spirit, what he's referring to is when the Spirit of God convicts our heart of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Those three things of our sin, righteousness, and judgment. When he convicts us of those three things and we reject the conviction of the Spirit of God, we abandon what God is saying to us in the matter of our salvation. He says there is no forgiveness. Let me explain that a little bit further because many people today are confused over what the unpardonable sin is. When I talk about the Holy Spirit convicting us of sin, That means that he is showing us that we have fallen short of God's standard. The Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That there is none righteous, no, not one. That we are all sinners before God. We need to be convicted of that fact. We need to come to the realization that we are not good, that we have all come short of God's glory, and that there is nothing that we can do to save ourselves because our sin has separated us from God. That is the first area the Holy Spirit begins to work in our heart and in our life over, convincing us that we are a sinner. The second thing he begins to show us is righteousness. Now, in and of ourselves, we have no righteousness. The prophet Isaiah said that our righteousness is as filthy rags in the sight of God that it doesn't matter how much good we do. It doesn't matter how religious we are, how many times we read the Bible, we pray, we give offerings, we go to church. None of those things will be, be able to make us righteous in the eyes of God. So obviously the Spirit of God is not talking about our righteousness. He's not trying to convince us that we are good enough to earn our own salvation. He is highlighting the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He is our righteousness. The Bible says that through his death on the cross and his burial and his resurrection, he has provided the righteousness that we need in order to be saved. Jesus died for our sins. He was buried and he rose again to offer us the gift of eternal life. Jesus Christ is the righteousness that we are to put our hope and our faith and our trust in. And it is the Spirit of God that convinces us that there is no other way except through Jesus Christ. Jesus said in John chapter number 14, verse number 6, that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. But then there's a third thing the Spirit of God begins to work in our heart and life over. Number one, he convinces us that we're a sinner. He proves to us that Jesus is the righteousness, the only hope. But then it says that he convinces us of judgment to come. He brings us to a decision. There are two ways that we can go. We can either follow the Lord Jesus Christ, which has been described in Matthew chapter number seven as the narrow way that leadeth to life eternal. Or we can stay on the broad way that leadeth to destruction. Meaning that we can follow our own thoughts. We can pursue our own religion. We can go a way that we think is right. But the end thereof are the ways of death. This is the message of the word of God. All of sin. But the hope of all mankind is only in Jesus Christ. And every man, woman, and child is going to have to make their own decision. God has given us a free will, a choice to make. And we either choose to accept and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, or we choose to reject Him as our Savior and remain in our sins. When we choose to remain in our sin, we have committed the unpardonable sin. When we have rejected the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, we have committed the unpardonable sin. God cannot forgive those 
who are not willing to humble themselves and cry out for forgiveness and salvation. That is the unpardonable sin. Suicide is not the unpardonable sin. Murder is not the unpardonable sin or any other sins that are listed or others would highlight as vile, wicked sins that would keep you out of heaven, none of those are the unpardonable sin. The only thing that will keep you out of heaven is rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. Now, a lot of people today are confused on that, especially when it comes to the topic of suicide. They say, well, that individual took their life and now they can never go to heaven. They could never have been saved. But the Bible is very clear that salvation is found in Christ and Christ alone. And when a person repents and puts their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, they are eternally saved. Yes, even if they come to that sad place in their life where they choose to take their own life. Now tonight on Transformed by Truth, I would like to address this topic of suicide because I believe it is important to reach out to those who are so deeply wounded that they are considering ending their own life. According to recent statistics, every year over one million people in our world choose to end their own life. This affects Fiji and the South Pacific. In fact, Fiji is considered to have one of the highest suicide rates in the world. That's according to our own government research and their own website. The suicide rate in Fiji is one of the highest in the world. That ought to break our heart. That ought to concern us. What is going on in our own communities? What is happening here in the South Pacific that is causing people to make this decision to end their own life? Now, please listen carefully. You may not be thinking about taking your own life. You may not be deliberating with suicide. But there are many people around you that are thinking that way. They may be family members. They may be close friends. They just may be the person on the street or at the bank or the grocery store. Someone that you don't even know, but there's something going on in their heart and going on in their life. And they're entertaining these thoughts of ending their life. Just this morning, I received a phone call from a woman asking that I reach out to her daughter. Her daughter continues to run away. Her daughter continues to say, I'm going to end my life. And this is deeply impacting this woman. She's concerned for her daughter. She's afraid. Is she going to end her life? She's crying out for help. I'll tell you, it's going on all around us. And we cannot allow our fears or our sadness over this dark and difficult issue to keep us from reaching out and helping those who are hurting helping those who are crying out or maybe silently crying out saying, I need help, I need answers, I need solutions because I've come to a place in my life where I don't even believe that living is worth. And so it is with clarity, compassion and conviction that I must speak on this terrible reality. Because suicide is something that is facing our culture. It is something that is growing. And in the days in which we're living now where people are losing their jobs and, and hardships are coming upon them and relationships are being strained, there will be an increase in this thought process, should I end my life? And I believe there are answers. I believe there is hope. I don't believe that this is the way that man ought to go. And so I want to address this topic to help those that are living in the dark pits of suicide. And so how should we respond? How should we respond to somebody that is considering suicide? We already know this, that suicide is not the answer. We already know that if we're entertaining these thoughts, that it's not the right mindset. So I want to address those of us that are wanting to reach out, wanting to help those that are struggling in their life, that are talking about suicide or even attempting to take their own life. 
How do we reach out to them? How do we respond? Well, number one, I think we need to respond with compassion and honesty. When most people hear of someone talking about suicide, they react out of fear. And they either get angry, they gossip about them, or they speak without even listening. Anger is not going to solve the problem. Yelling at someone or telling them that they're foolish or stupid to think that way is only going to provoke them and wound them even deeper. Going and gossiping to your family and friends and telling people, saying, well, do you know this person's talking this way? Did you hear that someone tried to kill, their, kill themselves? That is not going to solve anything. In fact, according to the Word of God, gossip only adds to the problem. Listen to what Proverbs 26 and verse number 22 says, The words of a talebearer are wounds, and they go down into the innermost parts of the belly. If we gossip and we speak about others that are going through dark times in their life, it is only going to continue to wound them even deeper. And then speaking without even really knowing the situation is not going to solve anything. Giving them life is worth living, that type of speech is rarely going to work because in their mind, life is not worth living. They've come to the end where they say, there's nothing that I can do. There are no solutions. There is no hope. The only answer is to take my life. So giving them a pep speech trying to rally them and motivate them, saying life is worth living is not going to work. What a suicidal person needs most is a listening ear. Not unconvincing responses, not empty promises, giving them the speech, well, it's all going to be all right, things are going to get better, it's not going to work. Listen, first of all, you can't promise that life is going to get better. Life is difficult. Life is painful. Life is challenging. Suicide is often seen as a way to escape the pain, to escape the difficulties, to get away from all the problems. So you coming in and telling them life's going to get better, what happens when it doesn't get better? What happens when things don't improve? There's only more reasons now to consider suicide as the option. Now, don't get me wrong. I believe that action needs to be taken when someone is threatening or attempting suicide. I'm not just promoting this. Well, we need to have a listening ear. We need to sit down and just hear them out. There are times where we need to call the police. We need to seek medical uh, attention and help. We need to remove dangers from that person's life. But oftentimes, those who commit suicide are giving warning signs long before they attempt it. Their talk changes. Their attitude changes. Their actions change. And there are these warning signs that their life is getting to a place of deep depression and their mindset is not right and they're beginning to entertain things that are destructive and wrong. And if we catch those warning signs then maybe we can stop that person from getting to the point where they feel that the only option is to end their life. We need to engage people that are hurting. We need to listen to what they're saying, show genuine compassion, and then most importantly, point them to the hope. Give them that bright light. Give them that understanding that there are answers. There are solutions. There is hope in life. Yes, life is difficult. The pain may not subside. The trials may not end, but there is a hope that we can look to. There is an answer that will help lift us out of that dark valley and give us a reason to live. Now you may ask, well, what is that hope? Is it counseling? Is it medication? Is it developing a better self-esteem? Is it seeing an increase in finances and money? Is it a matter of this? We'll just go out and get more friends and the more friends you have, the more joy you'll have. 
Well, those things are good. But understand, lasting hope will never be found in counseling, money, friends, a better self-esteem. And the reason for that is because suicide and suicidal thoughts are a spiritual problem. It's revealing that there is a wrong focus, and because there's a wrong focus, there is a wrong mindset about life, about the problems of life, about the purpose of life. And when our mind is not right, then our behavior and our attitudes and our actions won't be right. So think about it in this matter of life. Should I live or should I not? Should I take my life or should I continue to live life? Well, it's all about this matter of life. First of all, let me ask you, who is the giver of life? Who gave you life? Now, there's a lot of false teaching today saying, well, there was nothing that gave us life. We just came into existence. But the Bible teaches something different. In Genesis chapter number 2 and verse number 7, it says that God created man and God breathed into man the breath of life. God is the author of life. God is the giver of life. Our life is in His hands. And that will help shape our right thinking. We're not here by accident. We're not here by chance. There is a God who created you. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. He has breathed into you the breath of life. You were conceived by the very fact that God ordained that your life come into existence. He is the author of life. But let me ask you this question. Who is the destroyer of life? Is it God? Well, according to John chapter number 8 and verse number 44, the Bible says that Satan is a murderer. Satan is the destroyer of life. He is the one that wants to end life. He is the one that promotes death and destruction, not God. God has given life and God wants to give us the grace and the help to live this life. John chapter number 10 and verse number 10 says, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. The thief is Satan. Notice there is threefold plan. To steal, to kill, and to destroy. None of that is good. But then the rest of the verse goes on to say, and Jesus is speaking this, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Notice it is this, he's come to give life and then to give the abundant life. He is proclaiming there that he is our hope. That when life gets dark, when life gets depressing, when life gets tough, when we come to this place saying, I don't want to live anymore, the light and the hope is Jesus Christ. Satan will only be there to cheer you on. He'll only be there to entertain those thoughts. Yes, suicide is the answer. Death is the answer. There is no hope. There is no purpose. There is no answer. He is the one that will fuel those types of thoughts. But God will always come and say, I've given you life. And I know that sin has brought difficulties into this world. And I know sin has brought troubles into this world. But be of good cheer. I've overcome those things. I am the author of life. I can give that eternal life and I can give that abundant life. Jesus is our hope. And I'll tell you how he is the hope. First, he frees us from the penalty of sin. And then he gives us a purpose to live. The reason so many people today are thinking of ending their own life is because of guilt and shame over how they've been living their life. They feel like a failure. They feel like they can't be forgiven. They feel like they can't overcome. And now the guilt and the shame is built up in their life. And now they have come to this place where they feel that death is the only option. Do you know that Jesus Christ can remove the guilt of sin? Almost 2,000 years ago, he went to the cross. He laid down his life for you. And the Bible says that he died for our sins. We can be made right with God because of what Jesus did in shedding his blood and dying on the cross for us. 
He paid all the debt. He paid all the penalty of our sin. The Bible says but with his stripes we can be healed. The Bible declares over and over again that through Jesus Christ and his shed blood on Calvary, the penalty of sin has been paid for. And if we'll come to the Lord Jesus Christ and we'll allow Him to forgive our sin and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness, then we will hear that He has a plan. He has a purpose for our life. And that purpose is wonderful. He has a wonderful plan for you and I. We see this illustrated in the testimony of the Apostle Paul. In 1 Timothy chapter number 1 and verse number 12, listen to what Paul spoke. Listen what, what he what he wrote to Timothy and wrote to you and I. 1 Timothy chapter number 1 and verse number 12, he says, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. He's saying there's a purpose, there's a hope that God has given me. There is something that God has given me to do that was satisfying and fulfilling. But look at what he said in verse 13. Who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. He said, before I met Christ, my life was eaten up with guilt. There was a shame of what I had done. I was a murderer. I was a blasphemer. I was mean. But when I met Jesus Christ, he gave me life and then he gave me a purpose. When Paul and Silas were arrested and thrown in a Philippian jail, we see here that God used them to reach out to a suicidal man. The jailer there in Philippi was about to end his own life. And you can read the story in Acts 16 verses 27 through 31. Here he is about to end his life and Paul and Silas cried out and said, Do thyself no harm. Don't kill yourself. There's hope. And what did they preach? They preached Jesus Christ. They preached that Christ was the answer for sin and he was the hope of this life. Suicidal thoughts reveal that you're listening to the wrong person. Jesus would never encourage you to end your life. Instead, he will show you that there is grace for living. Don't believe the lie of the devil. Don't believe what he's telling you. Suicide is not the answer. There is nothing too bad in your life that God cannot fix. There is nothing too troubling in your life that God cannot help you through. Others have been there. Others have gone through those dark valleys like you're going through. David said this, Why art thou cast down on my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? He's saying, why have I lost all hope? Why have I gotten to this place in my life where I don't believe life is worth living? And he encourages himself. He says, hope thou in God. God is my hope because God is my life. Oh, I hope that today you're not believing that suicide is the answer. I hope that you're not believing that that's the only way to end your hurts and your emotional pain. Because there is hope. And that hope is found in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And that is by walking with Him and having fellowship with Him and understanding that He has a plan and a purpose. He created you. He's given you life. And that life is worth living. Today, if you're struggling and you need someone to talk to, Please call Transform by Truth. Message us, email us, reach out to us. We want you to find hope in Christ. Your life is precious to God. He has a plan for your life. He has a purpose for your existence. And I understand that you may not believe that right now. You may not feel like God is, is going to be able to help you, but please give God a chance. 
and allow him to convince you that life is worth living. Please, don't believe that suicide is the answer. There is hope in Jesus Christ.